I'm delighted to present our next speaker, James Cassell, who's a well-known futurist and a strategist, and is going to talk to us about something we might better listen to. Are we doing it wrong? Bad futurism. It's more like pulling on you know, a strand of a web, and everything else changes around it and warps around it. And this is, in particular, only changes that matter are technological. This one pisses me off, actually. <laughs> Um, this is a lovely 1950s view of the kitchen of the future with 1950s, 1950s ladies in their futuristic kitchen. I actually wrote a piece about this you know, a little while, uh, earlier this year that just, it, it's so frustrating from the perspective of someone who does foresight work for a living. It's so frustrating to encounter people in this community, outside of this community, who really only want to talk about the nuts and bolts, who don't really care about how people live. Sorry folks, how people live is the most important part of this. And when you talk, thank you. And it's how people, how it's the lives of women, it's the lives of children, it's the, you know, how people, their day-to-day, -day, their day-to-day -day existence, how they, you know, where they find work, how, the, you know, not just the transportation technology, but what does it mean to be a mobile population? You know, we have, when we look back at the last 50 years, the big developments, yes, sure, Moore's Law, technology, blah, 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 it's really, it's the changes in the roles of women, changes in the roles of gender, of gender relations in, in gender identity, changes around ethnic relations, all of these things are far more transformative to our day-to-day -day lives. And God damn it, we need to pay more attention to that. Sorry. <laughs> And the last bit of, oh, last bit of, world <laughs> Everything works as <laughs> Okay. Um, this is something that's actually kind of fun to play with. When you're, when you're doing the world building, and yeah, I put that up. That's actually a Windows 95 blue screen. Um, this is a really fun one because actually, Playing when you're telling when you're creating a narrative, whether it's for science fiction, whether it's for strategy work, and you're creating a narrative about an emerging technology or an emerging process, you know, social process, having it screw up, having it not work quite as intended, is actually really useful because you're trying to tell a story when you're doing this, whether for you know, when you're creating this narrative, whether for entertainment purposes or for uh, pedagogical purposes, you're trying to, to tell a story that is larger than just simply what the words say. You're trying to illuminate a larger point. And by having the things screw up, having the machines crash, having people hack them, having the, well, Bill Gibson has this great line, the street finds its own uses for things. Follow that precept. Figure out not just what the designers want the, want the technology or the system to be used for, but how people who want to fuck around how people are going to want to have sex using this technology, how people are going to get in and steal things using this technology. Not because all technologies are dangerous or bad or any crap like that, but because everything gets used in ways that aren't intended. Follow that. Pipple. Only the economically or politically dominant group matters. Now this, these days, fortunately, is more of an issue for strategy and and professional futurism than for science fiction. Uh, have any of you read any of the stuff by Linda Nagata, by the way? Some really good... Say you know, the name again? Linda Nagata, N-A-G-A-T-A. -A -A. Uh, some really good uh, science fiction that, that takes some serious steps in looking at non-traditional populations. Um, and I don't just mean this as to bash on Romney or anything like that. That's not the point of this. And so I was looking for a group of, you know, a picture that's all white people. Well, that's where you get. Um, we have a bad habit in the professional side of things of only thinking about the people who have, what the people who have a lot of money are going to do with whatever we're worried about. And while that's certainly useful from a, am I going to sell a lot of this widget perspective, it doesn't really tell us a lot about how society changes. How the, in, how the decisions that we're making, how the choices and, and um, systems that we're developing, how they will change the world means more than how they will change the folks in Silicon Valley, as we was alluded to earlier, or the folks in New York, London, Tokyo, etc. Think big, think broad, think wide. Is William Gibson in the room? 
<laughs> okay, if you're not William Gibson, don't do this. William Gibson is pretty much the only one who can get away with talking about brands in, this, in his narratives and have it not sound like product placement. <laughs> Um, it really irritates me when I'm reading a story, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to look at you. Yes, Natasha, you're really irritating. No, um, no, it really irritates me when you, you read through a narrative, again, professional or science fiction, and you stumble across the, and then he pulled out his Mitsubishi, you know, and it started throwing out the brand names, and they said, oh, and it works with the, it's a CCD camera, and not a, uh, look, folks. When you have, think about the conversations you have with your family. Think about the conversations that your family members have with their friends. You, know, you guys may be a little bit too techy, but family members, when they're having these conversations, they don't lay out the brand name unless that is the point of the conversation. They talk about my laptop, not my Apple MacBook Air. You know, I talk about my phone, you know, my, not my Samsung Galaxy 2. People, when you're trying to construct a narrative that's of a, of a believable future, people don't care about brands. Sorry for any advertisers in the audience. Um, this one's a little weird, but what I mean here is that there's, when I say behavior doesn't have to make sense, what you find, not often, but often enough, is when you see these narratives, when you have these narratives of the future, professional or science fiction, where people do really crazy things and it's hand waved away as, oh, it's the future. Yeah. The people, you know, the person who, when we jump ahead 50 years, the people who live, live 50 years from now, people who live 10 years from now, 20 years from now, have the same kinds of issues, have same kinds of reasoning and rationale. It's okay, we will hand wave away the possibility that we're all uploaded and living in you know, somebody's USB drive. Uh, but people have, very, have had the same kinds of issues that they've been wrestling with, the same kinds of reasoning to get to you know, points A, B, C for, for millennia. And it's sloppy futurism to have people do something weird and simply hand wave it away of saying it's the future. And I mean that thing, and when I say do weird things, I mean things like willingly cut off their arms and replace it with a cyborg arm. Really? Okay, last bit. I know I'm, I'm trying to rush through here because we're short on time. Scenarios. You need a good, a bad, and a middling scenario. Again, this is the professional side of things. What you often find is that people have, are trying to tell a larger story with their scenarios, trying to get you to drive you to a particular conclusion. And in, so to do so, they say, well, we're going to give you an, a set of different scenarios to play with, different options, different worlds to look at. But they've really coded them ahead of time to say, this is the one we want you to look at. And then this is the one that's maybe OK. And then this is the scary bad one. That's not useful. If you're trying to construct scenarios as a way of helping people make decisions, as a way of helping people understand the different possibilities, different options ahead of them. You want all of the scenarios, three, four, five, whatever, you want them all to be equally, if possible, equally appealing, equally seductive, equally terrifying. Because what you want people to realize is that choices matter, and we're not just living on rails. We're not just going driving towards a single outcome. We need to understand that if something happens, ex something external happens that pushes us away from that outcome, we're going to have to feel, figure out how to deal with it. Having, just having a good, the bad, and the ugly doesn't help. All it makes for an interesting movie. And it's related to that scenario is just a morality play. The idea that in the, in the professional side of things, they're referred to as normative scenarios. It's basically, what you do is you construct these vision or these forecasts of the future that are really trying to get people, drive people towards a particular moral choice. Now, that's great for fiction. The Handmaid's Tale is a terrific novel. But that doesn't make for a good scenario process. And I know I'm going jumping back and forth between the fiction and the nonfiction, or fiction and the professional side of things, but that's because there's a lot of bleed through. I know a lot of science fiction writers who actually are actively involved in this scenario work. And I know a lot of scenario professionals who are frustrated science fiction writers. I'm not going to raise my hand, but I could. <laughs> It is insulting to your audience 
It's insulting to your audience to simply try to lead them by the nose and tell them what they should believe. If you, if you think you have a particular moral case that you can make, then make it and trust that your audience is smart enough to be able to understand your moral case and why it's the better option. And if they don't, it may be their fault, it may be your fault. So trust your audience. Understand that they are, they are complex thinkers, too. Lastly, it's more believable if it's depressing. Depressingly, this one is probably true. I've done a lot of foresight work, a lot of scenario work with everything from neighborhood school, school districts to global top, you know, top 10 co corporations, government school work. And it's fascinating and incredibly frustrating just how hard it is to get people to imagine believable, positive futures. Futures that actually fe where the world feels better than it does today. You can get them to come up with the most incredible dystopian stories, and they will rush to embrace them. Try to get them to imagine a plausible, not utopian, but decent, good, uplifting, in the lower you were, you said, lowercase u sense, a future, and it's like pulling teeth. They, in some cases, just simply refuse to accept the possibility of a better future. Now, that may not be the case of people here in this audience, but if you do this work professionally, you'll find this time and again, people don't want to hear the good, you know, they want to hear good news because it doesn't sound serious. And that's the, story, that's the response that I get when I really press on it. It doesn't seem serious to them to think about. They, want to, they know it's a serious, good thing to think about disaster. Yes, it's serious and good to think about disaster. But to only plan for disaster means that when you succeed, you don't know what the hell to do. You gotta plan for success as well as disaster. And I mean that both in the personal sense and you know, the, the, your little community sense, your organizational sense, and in the broader social sense. We need to be, when we look ahead at all these possibilities, yes, it's important to, and it's critical to think about how they might turn out badly, how they may get misused, how they may be taken as tools for, for theft or crime, you know, whatever. But it's also important to think about how could they be used in ways we don't expect to make our lives better. You know, just for a second, think about what happens to the emergence of smartphones. It's pretty likely that the kinds of, um, casual social networking connections that we all embrace, we all, and nearly all of us will use, was the point of the creation of these smartphones. I can guarantee you that at the time when these smartphones were first being developed, first being coming out into the world, there were people talking about how, what kinds of horrible things could be done. People you know, sneaking pictures of each other in, the, in locker rooms and the like. And yes, that happens, but that's not the only thing that happens. So look, um, I can t I could sit here for I could stand here for hours and talk about the way the ways the world could be changing and the kinds of, the kinds of things that Mez was talking about earlier, the kinds of issues that we need to be paying attention to when we write, when we create futures. But I thought it was actually more important to come up here and take a few minutes and talk about the really nuts and bolts bits, the stuff that when you, as professionals, whether science fiction writers, scenario professionals, whatever, when you try to, con to create narratives about the future, that you do so in a way that respects your audience, respects the choices that they have, and respects the future. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions, if anyone would like to speak up. Yes, here. <laughs> Don't make me walk too far. So this is a great follow-up question that I actually was going to ask David Pierce, and you addressed it, which is um, there was a, a cyberpunk reactionary thing called Cyber Prep, where they actually made a role-playing game about teenagers who live in an idyllic sci-fi future, and they just have like, an ax to grind or something to prove to the world instead of being in a dystopic nightmare. Can you think of any actual uh, stories other than like Star Trek or a few others? Or is there, is there any place where there's a collection of these if you wanted to find inspiration as a writer to write that kind of story? 
about a, a better future where this where the characters aren't driven by a nightmare scenario, they're driven by some kind of positive aspiration. Um, I think that actually just in the last in, in the last year, both uh, uh, Stan Robinson and David Brin had books come out that are very serious about the challenges that we face. You know, and that's one of the things about positive futures. They can't simply be utopian dismissing everything. Yeah. They have to say, they have to take the problems seriously and then wrestle with them, grapple with them, defeat them if possible. Mm -hmm. And both uh, 2312 and um, existence. existence, you know, and they had very different, you know, they had very different points, you know, you know it focus, you know, blah, 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 blah. they were talking about very different things in the novel, but both of them made, I think, a really good effort at creating plausibly, plausible worlds that dealt, that were dealing with the challenges that we face and actually felt like places that it wouldn't be perfect to live there, but I would imagine not being um, sad about living there. So one, one follow-up question. Um, when I, I think of the Diamond Age, where there's a bunch of like rich, affluent, and smart people who are like, we're really too stuck up and conformist. Let's make ourselves even more subversive. And so that was, that was like a high level of society that still wanted to go further. Um, is that uh, a new kind of conflict, like man versus what man could become, rather than man versus a conflict? Isn't that what most novels are about? I mean, human beings. But in the absence of a villain or, or a bad guy. Yeah, yeah, well, that, well, that's what I mean. That mo the best novels are not about people fighting some you know, <coughs> stereotype villain, you know, some uh, end game boss monster. The best novels are about people wrestling with what they could become for both the better and the temptations of what they could become that's, that are worse. Thanks. Hi. Um. I'm wondering about uh, fiction that focuses really primarily on changes in attitude. And um, my example from history um, that Deirdre McCloskey has written about, um, she said that the fundamental change that has brought about modernity is um, that around in the 15, 14, 1500s, um, there was an attitude that changed toward the rich, which said, Okay, so they're rich, but maybe they didn't get that way immorally. Maybe they're not necessarily someone we have a right to attack and take stuff from. And she says this led to behavior that led to a rise of the middle class, all this technology uh, improvements uh, socially generally for other people. More respect, and it all started with respect for each other and leaving each other alone. And it created everything that we can point to as an example of, of the future. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there's uh, any fiction writers exploring attitude change as the primary change for the future? Um, nobody immediately leaps to mind, but I'd be happy to, to give that question some thought uh, okay. as we go through to lunch. Um, but just one, just leaping off from that for a second though, uh, not necessarily about attitudes, although it definitely discusses attitudes. Uh, how many of you have read uh, Transmetropolitan, uh, Warren Ellis, uh, Derek Robertson? It's a comic book series, but read it. Read it. It's one of the best articulations of how bizarre and appealing and terrifying the future could be. Um, Warren's brilliant, and this is, and he goes and he spends a lot of time talking about at how attitudes evolve. You know, what happens when you have a world where people can change their biology? What happens when you have a world where people can, you know, get uploaded into a nanotech cloud? You know, what happens when that happens to your boyfriend? And that question of not just, well, what does the technology look like, but what does it mean to my relationships? We have one more question here, Adam. Um, that, that, I think, is critical. Yes, Adam. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, phrasing some of the scenarios in a provocative way. Um, now, when forecasting scenarios in order to get people's attention, if you do that, do you think what you're, you're actually taking from the realism of the scenarios that you're pro projecting into the future? And is that detrimental? Um, should we not be realistic with our scenarios that we're trying to make people think about? Well, no, we do want to be realistic when possible, but, but remembering that there is a goal beyond simply trying to create a checklist of what the future could hold. When you're, cr when you're crafting scenarios, the, the idea here is to create narratives of the future that would that give your audience a something to connect to. 
I mean, there was a conversation that was, we were having earlier where, where it was mentioned that you know, carbon doesn't, you know, CO2 doesn't have a lot of free radical or radicals to connect to chemically. That same, that same concept of you need to have some kind of hook, something that they can grasp onto that is either compelling because it pulls them in or is it, it feels um, plausible in a, in a deep, almost visceral sense of, okay, yes, this is happening to me now. And remember, whenever we're talking science fiction or you know, scenarios, they're as much about the present moment as they are about the future because the best kinds of stories are about how you get from here to there, not just about what there looks like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.